Hello, my name is Vyacheslav Higorov and this is my talk, 10 years of Dart. Uh, in this talk, I would like to cover the evolution of the Dart programming language and the changes uh, that occur to the Dart virtual machine uh, as it followed the evolution of the language itself. Uh, this is my uh, fifth attempt to record this talk and I have come to realize that I am unable to cover all of the small changes that occurred uh, uh, during this period. So uh, I'm going to be focusing on two things specifically. On the language side, I would like to cover the shift from a dynamically typed language to a statically typed language. And uh, on the virtual machine side, I would like to focus on the shift from a virtual machine that is focused on the just-in-time compilation uh, towards a virtual machine that is capable of both just-in-time compilation and ahead-of-time compilation. Because I don't have much time to cover the language itself, I would just like to highlight a few things that make Dart 1 a language challenging to compile ahead of time. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious things is that in Dart 1, type annotations served the purpose of comments. So they were completely ignored by the execution environment. It was a valid program to, to, to declare a a variable typed as a doc and put an instance of cat into that variable. Uh, that consequently means that uh, operations uh, with references, like accessing fields uh, or calling methods, are all dynamically dispatched in runtime. And they can resolve to many different things. Something that looks like a property access can indeed be a field access, but it can also be an invocation of a getter or a, an operation called a method here of or even a no such method invocation. No such method is a mechanism similar to small talks do not understand. Uh, additionally, uh, Dart has no primitive types. So all types are reference types and all reference types are nullable. So uh, if you declare a, a, a variable of type int, uh, it can actually contain a, a null inside. Uh, and uh, finally, integer type uh, in, in, in Dart 1 was uh, arbitrary width which added additional challenges. So it should be quite clear uh, by this point that Dart 1 was designed to be just-in-time compiled. Uh, anything short of just-in-time compilation would not be able to produce uh, an efficient code out of a language with this level of dynamism. Uh, by now, or rather uh, by 2012, uh, when we started building a just-in-time compiler for Dart. Uh, uh, it already at that point, it was pretty clear how to build a, a good just-in-time compiler. What is the secret uh, to building a good just-in-time compiler? Well, the secret is that you need to create a loop between execution of the code and uh, a compilation. So uh, a compiler starts by generating some code, the code runs, and then it feeds some information about the state of the program uh, and uh, what happened during the execution back to the compiler, we should use this information to produce more efficient versions of the code and so on and so forth until the system stabilizes. Uh, I said that it was clear by uh, uh, 2012, but in reality, this technology has uh, uh, existed since uh, at least 90s when it was pioneered for self and small talk. And uh, these days, it is hard to find a virtual machine, an efficient virtual machine that doesn't actually employ some sort of uh, uh, dynamic recompilation inside. So we followed this well-established recipe when we built a, a Dart uh, 1 just-in-time compiler. Uh, uh, we built it from scratch, so everything from front-end to the middle-end optimization passes to the back-end and the machine-specific assemblers was written from scratch. We have no external dependencies. Uh, and the pattern we followed, we uh, we took, as I said, from self and small talk. So we, we start by generating unoptimized code, and then we uh, collect type feedback as the program runs through the inline caches. We collect this feedback. Uh, and then we uh, feed this feedback into the optimization pipeline to produce specialized code. Uh, and then you repeat and repeat and repeat until the, there is some sort of stable point reached. Uh, because there are more interesting things to talk about, I'm not going to discuss any uh, uh, particular things about how the JIT is structured inside. Uh, but I would like to talk a little bit about the inline caching. Uh, 
so the way it works in Dart VM is that uh, each call site has two uh, bits of information associated with it. One is uh, an object which would uh, accumulate uh, information about the dynamic behavior of this call site. Uh, so it's some sort of a call site specific cache which will report, for example, uh, what kind of uh, uh, receiver classes were observed in this call site. Uh, and uh, uh, will cache, uh, for example, the results of method resolution on those classes. So, for example, uh, if this class has seen an instance of uh, class doc, what does uh, uh, the method bark resolve to on that class? And the second bit of information associated with the call site is a piece of machine code, uh, handwritten machine code, uh, which performs the dispatch. So it starts uh, by consulting the cache. If there is already a cache entry in that uh, in that cache, then it will be used. Uh, otherwise, the runtime system will perform the resolution and populate the cache, and then we will jump to the result of the method resolution. So it's uh, it's our interpretation of the classical technique of the inline caching. Uh, if we uh, uh, dive past the abstractions and look directly into the machine code, this is what a G Dart uh, one uh, uh, just-in-time compiler would generate. So it will start by uh, uh, producing an unoptimized version of the call site where uh, uh, we first load um, a call site specific ob cache uh, object into a dedicated register, which is uh, uh, a register determined by the calling conventions of the dispatch stop. In this case, it's RBX. And then we call the dispatch stop. And one reason I'm putting this uh, machine code on the slides here is to highlight that uh, we uh, did not embed uh, pointers to uh, heap allocated structures into the code directly. Uh, and instead we used an indirection through an object uh, uh, called object pool. So this object pool essentially contains all the references a specific uh, chunk of machine code uh, needs for its uh, functioning. And uh, uh, this uh, chunk of machine code has access to this object through a dedicated register called uh, pool pointer, uh, PP. Uh, uh, which is populated on the entry to that chunk of machine code. So it will become important later as we start discussing the evolution of the Dart VM. So uh, let's just uh, uh, look at the call site in the inline cache. It starts empty and uh, then the execution happens and you, for example, reach this call site with an instance of a doc. Uh, maybe you reached it many times, maybe you reached it 555 times. Uh, this uh, count is recorded in the in the inline cache alongside the uh, mapping between uh, receiver classes and the results of uh, uh, method resolution uh, lookups. Uh, the reason why we record the counts is that it uh, allows to perform uh, uh, polymorphic inlining uh, and use those counts to sort the uh, possibilities based on the frequency. So uh, some small piece of information here. Uh, so when the surrounding function becomes hot, uh, an optimizing compiler comes and uh, performs a specialization of the code based on the information collected by inline caches. Uh, so for example, uh, here, uh, the, the optimizing compiler can uh, specialize the code under the assumption that the receiver of this method call will always be a doc. So it will in insert some sort of a check that validates this assumption into the code. And uh, after this check, it will just perform a direct call to the uh, to the uh, uh, target of the call. In this case, uh, doc method. So the the you can you can notice that we uh, still don't embed any references uh, directly into the generated machine code. We use object pool uh, to uh, reference objects uh, indirectly. Uh, there is again nothing novel here. Uh, it's a fairly established technique and virtual machines uh, from Java to JavaScript to uh, other programming languages, uh, they use it uh, quite frequently. So I don't want to dwell too much into the uh, details here. So we built uh, the, the, the just-in-time compiler for Dart VM uh, over the course of 2012-2013. Uh, uh, it's a, a pretty good uh, JIT, uh, has all the classical optimizations you would expect from the JIT and uh, has all the compiler passes you would expect to have from a, a reasonable compiler uh, and it showed a good performance. Uh, but uh, uh, something interesting uh, happened uh, in the end of 
2014 and the beginning of 2015, which uh, uh, caused us to look at uh, shifting gears a little bit. So um, a team at, at Google, uh, not directly related to the DART project, uh, started exploring ways to uh, improve uh, experience for uh, mobile developers. So, and uh, they have uh, built something that eventually became uh, a, a toolkit known as Flutter. So uh, uh, Flutter is the Google's uh, UI toolkit for building beautiful natively compiled applications for mobile, web, and desktop from a single code base. That's at least how the Flutter's own website uh, describes it. So uh, uh, this project uh, ended up choosing Dart as a programming language to build this toolkit on. Uh, and uh, that uh, introduced an interesting requirement on us. So uh, when this project originally started, it focused on mobile. Uh, and uh, if you looked at the mobile space, uh, you discover that uh, on some of the widespread uh, operating systems uh, uh, which, are, which are used in the mobile world, more specifically iOS, uh, you cannot perform just-in-time compilation. Only uh, system applications uh, signed in a special way uh, can perform just-in-time compilation. And uh, an arbitrary user application cannot. So uh, uh, that puts interesting requirement on the Dart uh, as, a, as a platform that the mobile uh, uh, toolkit uh, uh, is being built on. Uh, more specifically, uh, we need a replacement for just-in-time compilation. We need to uh, look for a ways to compile Dart ahead of time because uh, uh, interpreter does not necessarily cut it. So we need to find a way to run it efficiently uh, in the ahead-of-time compile setting. So uh, the way we approach this problem is we, uh, as I have said, we have a pretty sophisticated compilation tool chain. Uh, and uh, what if we try to take this compilation and uh, instead of using it in a just-in-time uh, compilation setting, let's try to use it in a ahead-of-time compilation setting. So uh, uh, it turns out you don't need to change that many things. Uh, you need to figure out a way to disable uh, speculative optimizations in your pipeline because uh, you cannot dynamically regenerate code uh, uh, in response to the uh, type feedback or anything like that. So you have to generate a single version of the code that uh, works uh, reasonably well for all possible executions. Uh, then you start at entry point and then you compile transitively uh, all potentially reachable code. And then you need to figure a way to write out the uh, internal uh, virtual machine uh, heap state uh, on the disk, uh, uh, including the code itself. Uh, and then if you start back from that uh, serialized image, you don't need to compile anything because everything that is potentially reachable is already compiled. Uh, and that's how you achieve ahead of time compilation uh, in, by, uh, 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 by pre-compiling everything and serializing it on the disk and then loading it back. So uh, the most interesting part of it is the uh, serialization of the heap structures. Uh, it turns out that Dart VM already had support for serializing most of its internal uh, heap structures, because it had support for something called snapshots. It's the serialized form of uh, heap object graphs. And it's uh, similar to uh, uh, what Smalltalk calls images. Uh, unfortunately, by the point when we needed to develop ahead of time compilation, it only supported data, not machine code. So we needed to figure out a way to serialize machine code. Uh, and obviously, for serializing the machine code uh, and reading it back, you need to somehow perform relocation of the machine code. That's what, for example, linker, uh, runtime linker does uh, when you load uh, um, an executable image uh, uh, on your computer, right? Uh, uh, so if we look at how the uh, generated machine code was structured uh, in the in Dart 1 uh, JIT, uh, we discovered that it's almost already relocatable. It, it actually has only a single reference to a, a, a heap uh, because uh, as I have said before, it does not refer directly to any objects in the heap. It's uh, using uh, an indirection through the object uh, pool. Uh, so there is only a reference to the object pool itself that is written in somewhere in the header of the instructions object uh, that uh, uh, needs to be relocated somehow. Uh, so the way it works is that we put the, uh, the reference to the object pool in the header and then 
on the entry to a function or an entry to a generated piece of machine code, uh, we use the instruction pointer relative addressing to uh, get the reference to an object pool from the header uh, and put it in a dedicated register. And then the rest of the code uh, addresses uh, uh, objects in the heap through the uh, pool pointer. So um, uh, in, a, in a language like, uh, I don't know, C++ or Java maybe, uh, you would expect that uh, you just put the instructions objects into the uh, into the read only read execute uh, uh, section of the uh, I know elf binary, and then you put the uh, pool objects into the um, read only data section on the on the in the binary, and then the runtime linker will uh, use relocations to fix things up. Uh, but uh, that does not really work with uh, Dart. And one of the reasons why it does not work with Dart is that uh, Dart has this uh, thing called isolates. So isolates is a Dart concurrent primitive or primitive of concurrency, uh, which allows you to spawn instances of the VM. And, uh, uh, and uh, each of those instances have uh, an independent uh, heap inside. And... Uh, uh, there is a single mutator thread associated with each isolate. Uh, and uh, that unfortunately means that uh, these isolates, they have copies of the state inside and they cannot uh, see each other copies and they cannot reference each other heaps because the, those heaps are completely isolated. So uh, more specifically, if we have like object pools uh, for uh, the same... Uh, instruction objects. Those pools need to be duplicated between different isolates uh, because even if the pools were not writable, they can refer to the mutable data in the isolates. But in reality, pools themselves are writable as well. So uh, they need to be duplicated between isolates because isolates cannot share any state, including the metadata like object pools. So uh, that means we have a situation like this where we need to write uh, instruction objects into read-only, uh, read-execute um, section of the binary, but we cannot put pools in read-only part. We have to put it in the isolate-specific, uh, dynamically allocated chunk of memory. Uh, so we need to find a way to do that. So uh, that also means that the uh, instruction object can no longer have uh, a pointer to the pool because there will be many different pools using the same instruction objects, so that reference has to go. So we have a picture like this where we have uh, removed the uh, object pool uh, reference from instruction objects. The instruction object is written out in the read-execute read section of the binary and pool is somehow put in the isolate heap. Uh, so how do we connect these two? Well, we have an additional object which references both of these pieces of information. So we call it a code object. Uh, it refers to a pool and uh, a corresponding instruction object. So we kind of uh, rever reverse the direction of the errors. Previously, they were going from instructions to the pool, and now they go essentially kind of from the pool back to the instructions. Uh, we add an additional uh, uh, indirection object. Uh, so. Uh, how do we then make the, the, the code uh, find this uh, pool? Well, we change calling conventions. So we, uh, uh, we say that on every call, we would put the code object into a dedicated register, uh, denoted here as a CR. And then the, at the entry, the, the instructions will be able to find where uh, the pool is by uh, looking uh, at the field in the code object, which is being passed in this dedicated register and put it, uh, into a predicated pool register, the PP, and the rest of the code doesn't have to change. So uh, here is how things look like after that change. Uh, so the, the before, uh, we would have the calling sequence that looks like you just call some uh, something directly, and then in the prolog, in the beginning of the target of the call, in the callee, uh, we use the uh, uh, instruction pointer relative addressing to get access to the pool pointer from the header of the instructions object. And after this change, we, uh, we do something different. We load the code object, then the code object contains an entry point, which we will call, and then in the instructions, we would uh, use the uh, code object also to get the pool pointer. Uh, 
So that's how it, it looks like after the change. So it, as you can see, it adds a little bit of an indirection into the calling conventions. But it, this change makes all the code relocatable uh, because it no longer refers to anything in the heap. You can just write it out, map it in arbitrary place in memory, uh, hook it up to the code objects, and uh, you're ready to run. So the serialization, deserialization of heap is, uh, is essentially done by doing this. Uh, so the disabling speculations is not really an interesting topic. You just go around and disable things. Uh, but uh, it turns out if you disable speculations, uh, you need to find some sort of a replacement for them because uh, Dart1 heavily relied on speculations to produce a good performant code. So, uh, so in the period between 2015 and 2016, we were developing the AT compiler and what we once we developed the kind of a skeleton of it by uh, implementing this, uh, the changes necessary to serialize the code, uh, we started looking at performance. And uh, what we noticed is that, well, unsurprisingly, everything in the Dart one is a dynamic call, literally everything. And uh, uh, we looked at some approaches to make it a little bit faster because uh, uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, just running it as is, uh, uh, we're not going to cut it, right? And uh, so uh, what we did is that uh, uh, we employed some of the techniques that are well, well known already. So uh, we did inline caching as well in the in the, in the the AT compiler. We did uh, uh, inlining of some fast path for some operations, more specifically uh, for arithmetic operations. Uh, we did some local optimizations and a little bit of global optimization. Uh, but one thing I want to highlight here was that uh, it was very difficult to build global optimizations in the in this uh, system because, as uh, you have seen, the the what we did is essentially we took, took JIT and uh, turned it into an AT compiler, and uh, and JIT was based around the compiling method by method, so uh, performing any sort of a global optimization was uh, more or less impossible. It required a lot of hacks to. To achieve even the simplest things, because there is no information preservation uh, between uh, compilation of different methods. Uh, let's look at these uh, steps a little bit uh, uh, in details. So uh, uh, remember, each call type has two pieces of information associated with it, uh, and they live in the uh, in the pool. They reference through the pool. Uh, so it turns out uh, you can not only update, for example, a cache associated with the with the call, you can patch the entry for the cache, and you can patch the entry for the uh, stuff that is handling the dispatch. So this is what we did. Uh, we developed something called switchable calls, which is essentially uh, another uh, variant of inline caching, uh, which is in spirit closer uh, to how inline caching looked in the when it was first discovered in the context of small talk. So, for example, what we do, what we did for the switchable calls is that uh, in the monomorphic case, you don't just put it into the cache. Instead, uh, uh, you directly update the, uh, the, the place where the dispatch stop used to be with a pointer to an entry point uh, on, the, uh, on the method resolution target. So uh, for example, if the uh, dog woof method resolves to a, uh, to a dog woof, uh, to method woof on a class dog, uh, 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 you can update uh, uh, the entry in the pool corresponding to the dispatch stuff for this call site to point directly to the uh, dog woof method. And then in the beginning of that dog woof method, you will verify uh, that uh, you, you actually are coming here with the correct receiver. And if you don't come with the correct receiver, you will go to the runtime system, which will fix it up for you. It will repatch the pool and uh, dispatch the correct place. So um, this is how uh, uh, the first versions of an inline caching were described in the literature, and this is what we ended up implementing for performance reasons. Uh, then we also uh, did some inlining of fast path. Uh, it's very important because if you see A plus B in the code, remember it's Dart1, you don't know anything just by looking at the static types. Uh, so uh, all the operators can be overridden. Uh, all integers can be nullable, and the uh, integer itself is an arbitrary precision, so you need to inline some sort of a fast path. You cannot always go to a dynamically dispatched big number operations, right? So uh, 
what we did is like, for example, for the x plus one, if there is a reason to believe that this is going to be an arithmetic operation, you would inline a piece of code that performs an arithmetic operation on a small integer, uh, which is the uh, uh, tagged version of an integer stored directly in the pointer. Uh, and then uh, uh, if it's not an integer actually, then it will fall back. Or if it's the result of the operation it does not fit into the small integer representation, it will fall back on the generic method call, which would handle all other situations. Uh, it's obviously uh, faster than doing dynamic dispatch, especially if you work with uh, small integers, but uh, far from what a JIT could achieve because it could uh, uh, eliminate uh, 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 redundancies based on the data flow inside the method. And here we are just optimizing each individual call site uh, where we have a uh, belief that this is likely to be an integer operation. So uh, more or less, uh, we are scraping the bottom of the uh, of the barrel, of optimizations barrel here. Uh, so uh, uh, when we implemented all of these tricks and a few other tricks, uh, we still were nowhere close to the JIT performance. It was good enough to get flutter off the ground, but uh, obviously uh, uh, it was quite challenging to squeeze out more. So if we look a little bit backwards in time, uh, again to the 2015 or a little bit earlier, 2014 and end of 2014, and look at the Dart uh, platform ecosystem in general, not just focus on the uh, native Dart execution, but also on the, uh, how Dart was executed in the browser, we would see the following picture. So um, on native side in 2015, remember it was before we started working on the AFT compiler, uh, we used just-in-time compilation both for development and the production builds. And on the web, uh, we used something called Dartium, which is the, uh, a fork of Chromium uh, with Dart PM embedded alongside the JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, and we use this Dartium uh, as, as a development environment for uh, web applications uh, so that the people could write Dart code and directly run it in the browser. But if they were to ship their web applications, they would uh, compile it ahead of time to JavaScript. So, uh, uh, so here you already can see a little bit of a dichotomy uh, similar to what we are arriving in, arriving to uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, native execution environment for Dart, but uh, the web story had a little bit of a challenge and the, the challenge was Dartium. So uh, whenever a new version of Chrome would come out and those come out very frequently, we would have to update and sync out fork and update the bindings for the Dart VM and sign and so on and so on. And it was a very heavy uh, work and it was a, essentially a maintenance liability for us. It was very hard to keep up with the uh, Chrome evolution. Uh, the ahead of time compilation into JavaScript through the Dart to JS compiler was not an option for the development environment because it was too slow. So the iteration cycle is the reason why they even use the JIT compilation and, and Dartium in the first place. Uh, so the Dart to JS was not an option as a development uh, environment uh, tool chain. So an idea was born to try to build a compiler, an ahead of time compiler, which would be modular. So it will not be using like whole world compilation. Uh, uh, similar to what Dart2GS was doing. Uh, so it will be faster. It wouldn't be producing such an optimized code as Dart2GS was doing. Uh, but uh, to compensate for that, uh, it would only operate on a subset of a Dart language with certain changes to the semantics. Uh, and this uh, subset of Dart will be much stronger typed than the Dart one. And uh, this sort of a stronger typing would provide a, a, a replacement for global optimizations that the Dart2GS uh, was doing in its uh, ahead of time compiler. So uh, this was a project for Dart development compiler and the project for developing also a type system, a stronger type system for the Dart. Uh, it started at around the end of 2014 and then continued for several years because well, as you can imagine, designing an, a stronger type system for an already existing language is quite a challenge. Uh, especially doing it in a way where you can uh, migrate code relatively easily into this uh, new uh, subset. Uh, and another project that started uh, roughly at the same time, like 2016, uh, was a, a project for developing a unified 
uh, front-end infrastructure for Dart. So one thing that we realized around that time is that uh, initial decision to uh, to build all implementations of Dart programming language independently uh, did not scale. So uh, if you look at how things uh, uh, were uh, uh, before, uh, you would notice that there is a, a each implementation of Dart programming language, like Dart Virtual Machine or Dart to JS Compiler or Dart Analyzer, uh, they embed their own parser and their own representation of a Dart programming language, so their own type checking, so on and so forth. Uh, and they're all written in different languages in different styles and so on and so forth. So it was very hard to make changes to the language. You make a change to the language, all the teams, even if it's just a previous and tactical change, all the teams have to go and update their parsers, their ASTs, and so on and so forth. That, that is a very long uh, lead time to make an even smaller syntax-related changes to the language. So we started the project to address it. So we created a common front-end, PFD, which would incorporate the, the canonical way of parsing Dart into a canonical uh, AST representation for the Dart programming language. And this CFE and kernel will come with uh, type checking rules and uh, desugaring rules and so on and so forth. Uh, and the backends like Dart VM or Dart 2 so the Dart development compiler, which was developed in parallel, uh, would use this representation, will consume it and emit whatever they want to emit, be it native code or JavaScript or something else. So this was multi-year effort. Uh, going in parallel, uh, and it culmin culminated in the Dart 2 release in 2018, uh, where we uh, made two major shifts. Uh, first of all, we shifted to a common front-end foundation for our tools uh, in the form of CFE and kernel. Uh, I'm making the picture a little bit more pretty here than it was, uh, uh, like not all the tools shifted by the time of the release, but the process was going, right? And uh, another big shift that happened is that uh, after initial prototyping on the Dart development compiler and the strong mode, uh, people came to realize that this is what not only our tools want, this is what users want from Dart programming language. Uh, users don't really understand optional typing that much. They want early errors. They want their code to run in a predictable way. Uh, and, uh, and tools want type information that they can trust. Uh, so it was a win-win situation. So we changed the Dart type system to uh, to be a stronger version of it, to be a static version of it. And, uh, uh, and uh, essentially the strong mode became a, a new type system, a static type system for Dart. And these are two major changes in the Dart to release. And there was another small change that snuck under the radar. Well, there was plenty of small changes that snuck under the radar, but uh, one of them was that we also said, uh, nobody needs a, a, a arbitrary width integer as the default integer type. We're gonna cap it at 64 bit, and uh, that would simplify some of the backend implementation that no longer need to deal with possibility of an integer overflowing into the uh, big num. Um, so if we go back to this slide with the Dart 1 uh, compilation challenges, uh, Dart 2 actually addressed some of them. So you no longer can store a cat in a variable of type doc. Uh, you no longer can uh, shift uh, uh, one but to left by 100 and then right by 100 and get one as a result. Uh, you now overflow the 64 bits and you get zero as a result. Uh, and uh, if you have a dynamically dynamic invocation, it's no longer dynamic, right? It's if, if there is a static type on the object, uh, that types gives you the target for the invocation. So if there is a, uh, a variable of type T in the code and there is a, uh, a O.M invocation on that variable, then the, the, this M should exist on a type T. So uh, you cannot just call something dynamically. It has to be targeting something that exists in the class hierarchy of, uh, of uh, among the subtypes of T, right? So, um, uh, which of course uh, uh, simplifies the dispatch and stuff like that. So what did this, uh, these changes mean for the uh, ahead of time compiler? Um, well, the, the first change, uh, the, the, the strong mode, uh, it provided, as I have said, types that you can trust and you can optimize and specialize based on. Uh, 
uh, and the kernel, the, the shift to the uh, uniform front end and, uh, uh, and uh, uniform uh, AST representation for the program provided something that we were missing around the uh, whole program representation. So the, the JIT was based on the method by method compilation that only looked at the ASTs for a single method, never built the whole AST for the whole program. Uh, so uh, uh, we suddenly got a tool uh, to look at the program as whole. And uh, we took these uh, two things and we ran with them. So, uh, uh, for example, we build a, a, an optimization path over the kernel AST. So we build this optimization path in Dart, actually, not in C++, that would take a kernel and then it would annotate it with uh, more precise uh, type information uh, uh, based on the results of a global context sensitive analysis that you run on this AST. Uh, and uh, this analysis gives us uh, type information that is... Uh, more precise than what is available in the static type annotations because remember the static type annotations they only give you uh, uh, nullable subtypes as the, as the kind of uh, or super types as the as the information so if you have t uh, uh, a variable of type t uh, in the code then uh, it can contain any subtype of t during the execution and uh, or it now uh, so uh, when we look at this program, let's assume that the whole program, well, there is some class declarations that are not displayed here. Uh, if you just look at the method groom uh, in isolation, uh, you, you, the only thing you can say about A is that it's going to be a subtype of uh, animal, uh, and uh, A dot method could resolve into some implementation of method in the class hierarchy or in the subtypes of animal. That's all you know. Uh, but if you look at this under closed world assumption and you run the TFA on it, uh, then the TFA will infer that uh, the, the variable A will uh, contain a reference to a doc always. And uh, it, the invocation of a method will always uh, hit the specific implementation on the doc class, which can be useful for devirtualization of the method dispatch and so on. Uh, this is especially important in the context of uh, uh, primitive uh, uh, variables uh, like int and double. Uh, remember, they're not really primitive, they are reference types. Uh, and in Dart 1, well, you could not trust type annotations at all, so you could put, put whatever in those variables. In Dart 2, uh, you can trust those type annotations uh, because the language actually prohibits the user code from extending on implementing uh, int and double types. Uh, so you know that uh, those variables will contain uh, Null or actual uh, uh, number uh, type, uh, but unfortunately that's not enough to uh, unbox those things. So uh, you still have to use some sort of a box representation because null is a possibility, uh, and uh, and that of course uh, leads to larger code size and worse performance. Uh, but fortunately with TFA, uh, we can often prove uh, that these sort of variables are non-nullable. And, uh, and uh, in those places, we use unbox representation to pass the parameters. So use unbox representation to store fields of non-nullable int or double types. This, by the way, was an intern project that we ran on the team in 2019, 2020. Um, yeah. So one thing that happened uh, uh, once we kind of had the TFA up and running is that uh, we discovered that it... Uh, this devirtualizes a lot of methods, uh, of a lot of method calls. And uh, that highlights that the inefficiency that we introduced uh, when we uh, went and made uh, the code objects relocatable. So remember, this is how a static call looks like in the, 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 uh, generated by the Dart uh, VM AOT compiler at this point in time. Uh, so or at that point in time. Uh, it needs to load the code object, and then from that code object, it gets the entry uh, point, which it uses for the call, and then in the uh, in the uh, executable code of that entry uh, point, uh, it would load uh, a pull pointer from the code object. And uh, that's a lot of loads, a lot of indirect call, and so on, for something that is essentially a static call to a known target. So we uh, had a, 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 an effort to remove this overhead. And the way you do it is that you say, okay, there is no longer an object pool per 
uh, chunk of instructions. There is a single object pool for all ahead of time compiled code. Uh, that means you no longer need to be loading this pool uh, uh, on each entry. Uh, you load it once when you, your virtual machine transitions from C++ to the Dart compiled code, uh, and it just stays uh, in use uh, always, right? Uh, this allowed us to shift from these uh, three instructions to a single call using the relative offset. So you, you emit all the instructions into a single executable uh, uh, section, right, to the text section, and uh, they can call themselves relatively, and the pool pointer is already populated on entry at the very beginning of the programmer, kind of. Uh, so you no longer need to load the pool pointer again and again. And uh, it removes two loads and one indirect call, right? It's, uh, it's a significant improvement. Uh, another thing that we discovered uh, is that uh, the inline caches are quite good at dealing with monomorphic call sites. They, especially if you do the switchable calls technology, when you, uh, when you instead of using the dispatch stop, you patch directly an entry to the function as the, an invocation target into the pool. Uh, but uh, uh, they don't really handle well the situations when the call sites are polymorphic. And TFA virtualized most of the monomorphic call sites just based on the type information. So what is left are usually polymorphic call sites, or even megamorphic call sites. And those are not really well handled by the inline caching. Um, so we started looking for alternatives, to, alternative ways to implement uh, call sites uh, that were not virtualized by TFA. And what we uh, ended up selecting is, is known as the role displacement dispatch tables. Uh, essentially, each call becomes uh, a, a call through a big uh, uh, virtual table. So we, we don't have a virtual table per class uh, stored in the object itself. Instead, we have a gigantic um, uh, virtual table somewhere uh, uh, available to the code through the dedicated register. And uh, the way you call through this uh, dispatch table is that you, from the header of the class, you take a identifier of the, of the class, and then, which is some numeric uh, identifier assigned to all the classes. And then, each call site has a selector ID assigned to it. And the sum of the class identifier and selector identifier, uh, so selector identifier is selected in such a way that this sum gives you the dispatch target. If you look it up in the, this uh, global table, you should hit the, uh, an implementation of this selector on this class. Uh, the reason why we don't actually use virtual tables is because our types are interface types, right? So all virtual calls that were not virtualized, they are actually usually interface calls. So uh, or quite often they're interface calls. So um, we use the technique which is uh, uniform and can be used both to implement virtual dispatch, so the uh, dispatch that hits one of the subclasses and the interface dispatch, so the, uh, the dispatch that hits one of the implementations. So um, the, like, it might be a bit puzzling how to select uh, the selector IDs in such a way that this works. Uh, like there is a naive uh, thing that uh, helps you to think about this technique. Uh, you, you can number the selectors uh, starting at zero. Then if you select zero as a selector ID, that means the, the range from zero to number of classes minus one is occupied because uh, zero plus class ID uh, should give a unique cell in the table. Uh, that means next selector will be number of classes. And after that, the next selector will be number of classes plus number of classes, so two by number of classes and so on. But this will lead to a very sparse table and you don't want to have table this sparse. Uh, so the, the whole complexity here is around uh, packing this selector ID, so selecting this uh, selector IDs in such a way that the table becomes more packed, more compact. And you do this by exploiting the fact that uh, uh, the table is sparse to begin with because not all classes implement all selectors and not all uh, uh, classes can be a target of a dispatch with all selectors. So there are cells in the table which will never be in use, which will never be hit by any call site. So you can use those uh, to pack some other uh, combinations of uh, class ID plus selector in there. So, But again, there is nothing uh, innovative here. This is described in the literature as a role displacement uh, dispatch tables. 
Okay, so uh, what I have described here mostly happened in 2018, 2019. Uh, uh, this uh, sort of uh, work on uh, making use of the static types uh, that the Dart 2 has given us. So, what is in our future? So, we, we did this big jump from uh, Dart 1 to Dart 2 when we uh, changed how type system works, how method dispatch works, um, how uh, integers work. Uh, we are right now in the process of making another big jump. So, we are shifting from Dart 2 to Dart 2.12, where we say that uh, reference types are no longer nullable by default. So you can no longer put a null into a, a variable that is declared as, for example, an int. You need to actually explicitly declare uh, uh, a variable as the variable of a nullable type, something question mark, to allow null to be stored there. And uh, we have done changes to type system to make easy to work with this variable. So, for example, comparison promotes types and so on and so forth. Uh, this introduces additional information uh, for the compiler to optimize on. Uh, it, of course, also makes uh, uh, easier for people to write code that uh, uh, they can trust and that it will not throw exceptions around uh, he tried to invoke something on a null reference, but it also gives uh, uh, the compilation tool chain uh, information about uh, uh, nullability of different uh, uh, variables and fields that it could not maybe infer before, uh, because uh, global uh, type flow analysis uh, it's good, but it might not be uh, as good as uh, as encoding this information in the type system to begin with. So. Uh, uh, Notice that our compilation tool chain is already set up to make use of this information. So uh, we just need to know that it's uh, sound to do so. And there is a small uh, a footnote here. So uh, because this is a very big change to the type system, uh, the code needs to be migrated to uh, adhere to this non-nullability. Uh, and the migration takes time. So we allow uh, people to opt out their code during the migration from the uh, non-nullability. So a program can be a mix of code which adheres to non-nullability and which does not. And in this mode, you cannot perform global optimizations uh, uh, that would assume uh, that type annotations are sound. Uh, it is only sound if all the code is uh, following the non-nullability. So uh, in this migration period, uh, we can only optimize those uh, uh, those applications that have all of their dependencies uh, adhering to the nullability. But yeah, this and this migration will probably take some time, but anyway. Uh, but we continue to see, uh, as the time goes, we continue to see demand for smaller size and memory footprint uh, from our application. So we are looking uh, uh, at other ways to, uh, to deliver that uh, through various uh, changes to how we represent the program. Remember, we, we started our AOT as the uh, JIT compiler changed into AOT. Uh, and there is a lot of heritage there around the data structures and the representation of things that are not uh, characteristic for an AOT compiler. So we're trying to kind of uh, diverge from this JIT compiler heritage. Uh, one interesting thing that we did was we changed how we represent stack maps. So we have a precise GC. Uh, which needs stack maps to traverse the stack. And we used to have a, a stack, map, stack maps object for each piece of uh, machine code that we generate, uh, similar to how we used to have an object pool per uh, piece of machine code that we generate. Uh, so we moved to some sort of a representation that compresses this down, unifies into a single object for all the code in the system, which led to quite nice reduction in the memory footprint and the uh, code size. And uh, Another interesting thing that we are looking at is, uh, or we have implemented actually, is uh, trying to move away from this uh, kind of um, symbolic nature of JIT execution in the sense that uh, in the JIT you expect all simple information to be available. So for example, if you, if you uh, throw an exception, you get the meaningful uh, exception back with the names of functions and locations. Uh, but maybe in the ahead of time compiler settings, you don't really need it to be like that you usually expect to uh, to get something non-symbolic, which you would later symbolize on your uh, uh, server, for example. So we implemented a mode where we uh, emit uh, uh, dwarf 
uh, debugging information for or like uh, unwinding information for uh, uh, our uh, ahead of time compiled code instead of emitting our own form of uh, uh, location information. Uh, and when you hit an exception in the code, you actually get non symbolic stack trace, which you then can uh, symbolize using this uh, dwarf uh, information. And the dwarf information can be split out and uploaded to your symbol server or your crash collection server, which would handle the symbolization for you. Uh, this opens possibilities to uh, reducing the memory footprint and the size of the output of the AOT compiler because you don't no longer need to uh, embed all kinds of symbolic information into the resulting binary and you don't need to have it in memory. Uh, something that JIT has to have because that's just how JITs work. Uh, finally, there is another interesting highlight. Uh, there is a demand for low overhead concurrency. Uh, you would like to utilize all of the cores in the system. You would like the uh, UI to be rendered uh, while you are doing some work on another core. Uh, remember, we have uh, Dart isolates as the concurrency primitive, uh, and uh, they are not so lightweight uh, because, as I have said, they have uh, uh, full copies of uh, program structure or full copies of heap object graph uh, in the each isolate and uh, they communicate by passing messages and those messages are essentially passed by copying because isolates cannot refer to each other's state, each other heaps. Uh, so something that we are experimenting with is, uh, is the concept of isolate groups where isolates spawned from the same program share the same heap uh, and while they cannot on the user level uh, interact directly, so you, there is no mutable shared state that user has access to uh, in the Dart code. The underlying program structure and metadata that is in use by the virtual machine itself is now shared. That makes each isolate much more lightweight uh, and uh, opens uh, an interesting experimentation possibilities. For example, what if uh, an isolate that wants to send a message exits? then we know that the message itself is not going to be used by any other isolate. So we can just directly give it to a receiving isolate by passing the copy. And that can be useful in the context where you spawn some uh, parallel process and uh, per per the isolate to run in parallel and it performs some long-standing st computation, produces some large uh, result and it wants to pass it uh, without copying to the main isolate back. So uh, quite interesting stuff. Okay, that, that kind of uh, ends my talk, but I want to share uh, two learnings. So, uh, so one learning that I had working on the Dart team, working on the Dart project is that everything counts at some point in, in the time. Uh, if you have uh, four bytes of uh, space wasted somewhere, you might not think it's a lot, but at some point somebody will come and uh, say, in reality, these four bytes are duplicated by uh, one million times and uh, you waste a lot of memory by doing that. So uh, everything will count at some point. There will be a reckoning for every wasted byte and a wasted uh, cycle of CPU. Eventually, some user will hit this case. Uh, and when you design uh, virtual machines and you implement them, especially if you implement them from scratch, you always have to balance between uh, choosing specialized path and a generic path. Uh, specialized Tools are uh, fast to build and they produce good results, especially if you well, spend time specializing them. Uh, generic tools take a long time to build and maybe sometimes they don't produce such a good result and you need to invest a lot of time to, or to bring them to the on par with the specialized tools. Uh, but the problem is generic tools are also much simpler to evolve and build on top. And then specialized tools, you often have to rework completely uh, when the situation changes. And uh, I think this is a very uh, important thing to keep in mind that you have to balance between these two uh, states when you build a virtual machine. So uh, I think the ultimate recipe, and this is where I want to end my talk, is to uh, build virtual machines uh, out of specialized solutions built on the generic foundations. So you have to, this is the structure that I think will scale with, the, with time. Uh, no matter how your language changes and how your demands from users change. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you uh, want to enjoy other talks on the conference. Bye.